Okay. Uh, I am Jeff Stone, president of Project Help Long Island. I want to welcome everyone to our discussion tonight on our veterans and COVID. You know, join us as we discuss how COVID has impacted our veterans and the mental health and addiction concerns many face today. Our informative panel will describe both challenges and what we can do to support those who defend our country. And at this time, I want to thank everyone for their service. Uh, and whether you're on a panel or in attendance, I want to thank the, uh, uh, our other guest speakers, the clinicians who, who serve veterans day in and day out. Thank you all for, for coming on tonight. Uh, it's, it's very generous, very kind of you. And, uh, you know, uh, I, for one, appreciate it. I know Kathy does and Project Tell Long Island does, Absolutely. for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Uh, I'd like to introduce the first two. Jeff, speakers. Jeff, yeah. Jeff, be before you do that, may I just say, may I just say one thing that uh, we'd like to say thank you to the uh, Port Washington Library, of course, for providing the Zoom meeting service for, for Project Help Long Island. We welcome coalition partners, Dr. Joe Smith, Executive Director of Long Island Reach, Jennifer DeSana and Connie Bruno of Manhasset uh, Casa, and uh, David Sills and Ellen Ritz of NAMI. Project Help especially recognizes the generosity of the Peter and Jerry Dijana Family Foundation and the support of the Kiwanis Club of Manhasset, Port Washington. Okay. Okay. Uh, wonderful. Our First uh, speaker on the panel is uh, John Huber, and thank you coming on uh, last minute, literally, I think two hours before the start, but you know, something about you Marines are always ready. Uh, and John is a Vietnam veteran. Uh, he is an E-4 corporal, and uh, he was crew chief in a mobile radar unit 10 miles from the DMZ. Our next speaker is Neil Kopp. As he likes to say, he's just a kid from Brooklyn, another Vietnam veteran, Army. And uh, Neil was uh, assigned to a rifle company, Company D, 1st Battalion, 5th Cavalry, and made his first ride in a UE with the mail and breakfast early one morning at the end of 1967. Before you know it, he was Air Mobile, and he was uh, in assaults all over the Central Highlands, search and destroy missions by day, and at night, night patrols and ambushes were there and commonplace. Um, after, uh, uh, upon arriving at stateside, uh, Neil held a, a job at a, uh, a firm in Manhattan for uh, the rest of his, uh, until retirement. Um, and Neil's familiar with, with my wife, good friends. And uh, I want to thank Neil for coming on as well. And Neil does, uh, without getting into it, uh, does uh, 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 have uh, some PTSD and uh, diagnosed with that, uh, seeks a therapist, which has been really good for him. But working has been a great uh, godsend for him and uh, a, a company that really cared and knew how to love folks and uh, other issues that came up because of the PTSD, whether it was scared of poorly lit streets, cracks in concrete, reminding them of tripwires, humili humiliation of being spit on and so forth and so forth. So I needed to say that because it was a, 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 a huge thing uh, coming or to stateside and trying to live a somewhat normal life or to fit in. Um, and Kathy, you can take it from here on in. You could uh, introduce the big guy. Sure. Oh, well, um, I'd like to introduce uh, the clinicians and our uh, other vet. We'll start with him. This is uh, Carl Lelena. Carl, come a little bit closer to the screen so we can see your pretty face. Carl is, Carl, there you are. Carl is a retired New York City police officer and detective. He is a World War II veteran having served in the Philippines uh, while in the Navy. Carl doesn't mind if I say that he is 94 years young. I think he already said that before, right? You're gonna be 95 in September. Let me just say, and this isn't lip service, 
Carl is a vital and active member of the Port Washington community. He is constantly cooking and providing meals to the needy in town. And when I say constantly cooking, I mean like every day, every day. Uh, he is um, he is part of the backbone of this communi community. If there's a board, he's on it. If there's a cause, he's part of it. And he does all of this flying below the radar. Um, he doesn't seek any accolades or anything like that. He just does it because it's who he is. So Carl, we are so proud to have you on tonight. Thank you. I'd like to speak about the clinicians tonight. We'll start with Danielle Bonaparte Lozano. Danielle is a retired US Army veteran who specializes in military and veteran specific mental health services. She served as the military services coordinated, coordinator for Phoenix House in New York City and Long Island. She served as the military service, oh, excuse me, I'm repeating myself. Uh, Danielle currently works as a primary counselor at Victory Recovery Partners and serves as a community outreach liaison for Victory Partners, Suffolk County. Welcome, Danielle, and thank you for your service. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We have um, Dr. Lynn Lieberman. Dr. Lieberman is a clinical psychologist. Hi there, Lynn. And she is at the Center for Traumatic Stress Resilience and Recovery at Northwell Health. And I'm sure she'll be telling us much more about what she gets involved with. Thank you, Dr. Lieberman, for being with us this evening. And then we've got uh, Gary Buchan. Welcome, Gary. Uh, Gary is a licensed clinical social worker and an addiction counselor, but more than that, he is the president and CEO of, Bridge, of the Bridge Back to Life Centers. Bridge Back to Life is a chemical dependency treatment center. And in addition, Gary has served under four New York State governors on the New York State Advisory Board on Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services. So thank you, Gary, for joining us tonight. It's good to have you. My pleasure. And so off we go. Off we go with this event. And uh, Project Help has talked about inviting um, veterans onto our program and discussing the topic of veterans for a while. As Jeff mentioned, we probably have had 10 or 11, this might be our 12th virtual event mm -hmm. this year. And we've had um, very interesting panels and very interesting discussions. We've had the American Red Cross, we've had Island Harvest, we've had the Salvation Army, we've had wonderful clinicians who have dealt with depression and food uh, food issues. We've had parents uh, dealing with kids at home and, ha and, and COVID. We've had senior citizens. We have had frontline workers. Um, it's been quite an experience to have all of these people on. But I thought before we get, and Jeff agrees, if, before we get into the contents of tonight, if perhaps we could give um, uh, Danielle and uh, Carl and Neil and uh, and John Huber a chance to uh, maybe say a bit more about their service. Uh, maybe Danielle could start if it's okay to talk about her service in the military so we can know a bit more about her. Okay. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, I served in the U.S. Army. Uh, my MOS, I was a Patriot missile operator, so 14 Tango, and I served uh, from 94 to 2000, and, to 2000, and then from 2002 uh, to 2004. Um, I sustained an injury in, while I was in Afghanistan, and I became a service-connected vet. Um, I also have been diagnosed with PTSD and um, suffer from, from that, um, co-occurring disorders, and uh, also was a victim of military sexual trauma. So after service, uh, I came into 
this field, very passionate for me in, in dealing with um, primary focus was uh, female veterans um, and just veterans suffering from uh, PTSD. And I've been working with uh, veterans in Suffolk County and Nassau County and uh, throughout New York um, for about 10 years now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Carl, can we hear from you and about your military background? Right. Ironically, uh, I uh, enlisted in the United States Navy after high school in 1944, June. And uh, I went uh, to Sampson, New York, for my basic training. Subsequently, after that, I was sent to Camp Shelton, Virginia, as a uh, training in gunner gunnery. I was uh, qualified as a sight setter for a five inch 38 cannon. I was assigned to the armed guard, which is a, which is a naval gunnery unit assigned to a naval merchant ship that carried uh, supplies for the military. I went uh, through the Panama Canal in uh, uh, Christmas, January, 44, January 45. Uh, and I went into the Pacific and my first uh, stop was at Bougainville, New Guinea, the invasion there, and then Hollandia, New Guinea, where the action was still taking place. And we, we, we brought supplies to the troops. Ironic, one hold of our ship was loaded with beer. <laughs> we had beer from all over these United States. And one of the beers from Detroit, Michigan was known as Greasy Dick Beer. It was crazy. <laughs> I never saw beer with those names, you know. And boy, those guys loved us. They, they loved us for the beer. And uh, uh, with that, uh, we went into the invasion of Leyte in the Philippines. And I went right up the line, Mindoro, Manila, Corregidor, Subic Bay, Luzon, the whole thing. I was in, in the Philippines for the whole year. And uh, ironically, I was washing my clothes in August of 1945. Uh, and the sirens went off, oh God, another God Don air raid. But it was a surrender of the Japanese. Wow. Well, yeah, and thank God. And from there, we stayed in, in the Philippines until September, where we were then, with our ship, we went to Numea, New Caledonia, French possession. I and 25 other of us US military were taken off and put on a, a naval, uh, a military, all, all units base in Numea, New Caledonia. And French troops were put on that ship and they loaded that ship with, with chromium ore where, where, where the cargo food was, they put it chromium ore. And that ship then went, a, went through the Suez Canal to Marseille, France and brought those French troops home in the, uh, the latter part of 1945. Uh, in uh, November 28, 1945, I and a load of other troops were put on an aircraft carrier to go home. Uh, the hangar deck where all the planes you would be was bunks six high, all racks of Marines, Army, Navy, troops going back home. I, we, we, we landed in San, San Pedro, California, December of the 5th, 1945. Mm. Subsequently, I, I was given my pay and we couldn't cash our check. It was a $1,200 check. I had to go check cashing where they took 10% of our money to cash <laughs> our checks. That's what it was all about. And I, I caught a uh, uh, four days and five nights uh, uh, Santa Fe Railroad coach line that took us to Chicago, Chicago to Grand Central Station. I arrived in Grand Central Station in December uh, 12th, 1945, where God bless the taxi cab man. He took to two o'clock in the morning, he took me home to Corona, Queens, mm -hmm. where I grew up in, no charge. Uh, he took me to my home and my mom says, Honey, you're not getting into bed. You're, you're very dirty. <laughs> Go downstairs and make the fire to make hot water. I had to wash in, in the tub before I went to lay next to my brother, who subsequently was in the Korean War. <laughs> that's, 
that's my whole life in a sense. Subsequently, I went into the uh, police department. I, I retired as a first grade detective in 1975, uh, after 25 years. And I'm still pumping away. <laughs> I have a grandson that's 46. He was 15 years in Marines in Iraq, Kuwait, Afghanistan. He was a gunnery sergeant. His daughter, uh, what's her name again? Victoria. Victoria. She hey. was a corporal in a Marine Corps and she got injured after three years and she's going to college in Maine and she's mm -hmm. a very depressed child. I, I don't know what the injury was. And uh, my great grand, my, my grand, my great grandson also, her brother, uh, he's at the Virginia Military Institute. He's going to be an officer in the military. So we're a, mili we're a military family, so to speak. That's it. Thank oh. you, Carl. That was remarkable. Thank you. Thank you to your service and thank your family for their service. Remarkable. Thank you. Um, yeah. Neil, would you, would you like to, to tell sure. us a bit more about yourself, sir? Sure. Uh, I got drafted. Uh, what number were you? Uh, I don't know. But when I got in by the truckload and by the train load, we went down to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, for basic training. Uh, and that was March, well, September of 66, March of 67. Uh, I found myself in Vietnam, uh, the rifle company, the first cab division. Uh, I stayed until right after the Tet Offensive, uh, which was March of uh, 68. That's when I did our stout. Uh, I was very lucky. I wasn't wounded and got killed, no doubt. Uh, but pretty much everyone right around me, to my left and to my right, got killed or uh, wounded at one time or another. Uh, through West San Francisco International Airport on the way home, uh, 10 guys walked by, three of us, and uh, I got spit on. And I never said anything about that. Uh, uh, in 1979, I started working at Allen Company, where I worked for 34 years until I retired in 2012. Uh, I'm married 40 years in August, uh, coming August. I uh, have twin sons, they're both 31. Uh, we had a first reunion in 2012 in Branson, Missouri. Uh, it was a very tough time. I saw people I didn't know that I'd ever see again. I never stayed in touch with anybody. Uh, they just call my name. They're coming out of the field. I didn't argue with them. And I uh, got in a helicopter, went back to uh, base camp. But there I was. Uh, I probably saw eight or 10 guys that out of the 38 that were at the reunion. Uh, that served maybe a week with me, four or five months or 11 months with me uh, for the first time in all these years. Uh, it was like uh, the sibling that was separated as a child and all of a sudden they became reunited. Uh, it was a new family. Uh, I tell everyone I have a family at Allen and Company because they were my second family, but here it is, I got another family. And I've been fairly close with a lot of these men uh, over the years, unfortunately, over the years, since 2012, uh, three or four out of the 12 passed away for medical issues. Uh, I never went to the VA until this first reunion and someone said I should go get checked out. So I went and uh, uh, I guess one of the first questions, uh, do you sleep? I said, yeah, I get up three, four o'clock every morning, whether it's alarm clock or no alarm clock. Uh, I don't really have a need for sleep. Uh, and then as the questions went more and more, they said, yeah, I got a lot of these things that they call PTSD, which I never thought there was anything wrong with me, but here I was. So uh, uh, it took about two years and uh, I received 70% uh, disability for PTSD. 
uh, the and I was with the DAV helping me. And they gave up on me, said, no, it's pretty good. All right. So I went locally uh, where, I, where I live, uh, Ocean County, New Jersey. Uh, his fellow John Doherty runs the Ocean County Veterans, and so he's going to put an appeal in for me. He was a door gunner in uh, Vietnam. Uh, and that was in 2015. And ever since that time, I've been seeing a therapist every week. Uh, and I keep a calendar, you know, one of these old-fashioned things. Uh, this visit today, which was done on the computer, visit number 253. Over this period of time, uh, I found out a lot about me. Uh, I was seeing a veteran, uh, psychiatrist at the VA every month, two months. It was really nothing, you know, like uh, stupid questions, uh, trying to take, get me to take drugs, uh, tell me to sleep. Uh, but this therapist uh, has been a major help. Uh, and just from all the talks, uh, one of the things that Jeff mentioned was tripwires. I used to get, I call them bad thoughts. Uh, all the time. And I couldn't understand why I'm walking with a headset, minding my own business, no matter where I walked or where I rode my bicycle, boom, there was a bad thought. Couldn't figure it out. I'm talking to her. And I, I just realized it. When I saw cracks in the concrete, they reminded me of trip wires uh, and little things. And she was one of the first people I told about the spitting. Uh, how humiliating it was, uh, how I felt meeting these other people uh, that I served with in Vietnam, finding out who died, how much worse the casualties got. The next 12 months after I left, we only had 60 people in our company, uh, 25 men died. Uh, we made, it was a myth that we went into Cambodia after I left. I mean, it's like two weeks after I left, we went to Cambodia and that's where we had all these really bad casualties. Uh, and one of the things I did do, I started when I was in Vietnam. Uh, I didn't really know I was doing it, but I knew I was doing it. Um, I have a good Jewish mother. My mother would say, you got to write, got to write this, this, and this, and this, and I got like a big family between my mother and father. Uh, so I wrote letters and you can't tell them about what I was saying, how scared I was or anything. And I lied. I just told them I was having a good time. You know, we played uh, football, we played cards, we did this, we did that. You know, I went on r and art to Hong Kong and... That's how my life was for all of these years. I lied. I lied and I lied. I told everyone everything was good. In the meantime, I was waking up. The reason why I was getting up early, uh, continuous nightmares uh, over and over. Uh, the bad thoughts, afraid to, afraid of noises, loud noises, booms. Fourth of July, I was always went fishing. I used to find peace going blue fishing uh, from Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn uh, because it was away from all the booms that was going on. But the smell of the gunpowder as you arrived in Brooklyn was, I don't know if you went to Brooklyn, it was bad. Uh, but at least I got eight or nine hours of uh, peace. Uh, this went on all of my life. Uh, I never spoke too much about it uh, to my wife. My family, everybody knew that I served in Vietnam. Uh, both my sons were in the Boy Scouts, both became Eagle Scouts. Uh, uh, and I met some new friends in the Boy Scouts. And uh, uh, it was what I never got before. I got uh, people saying good things about me being a soldier. The same thing when I worked at Allen and Company. And it was a whole new life for me. Uh, so meanwhile, the appeal goes on. Three years ago, uh, I used to give blood every six months, whether where I worked, whenever they did it. And since I retired every six months over here, I became anemic. And uh, 
Well, the VA and my uh, yearly uh, physical uh, buying tablets for two years. And to this day, uh, I'm taking folic acid. My private doctor, is a car I got my insurance from uh, where I work. Uh, doctor said, do you want to know why you're anemic? I said, yes. And uh, I went to the hematologist at, at a hospital and uh, after Four months, they found out they have some called Waldorf's macroglobular anemia, Waldorf's drums. It's a big, long word, the whole thing. Uh, this John Doherty at uh, Ocean uh, Veterans submitted the claim. This is one of the miracles of life. So I got this appeal going for five years, but he submitted this claim December of 18, in May of 19. I got a letter from the VA. I'm 100% uh, not permanent disabled because of this cancerous thing. Uh, it's related to Agent Orange. It's a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, and finally in September, this past September, I went in front of a you know, judge on a video with his fellow Don Doherty. Uh, he said it would take three months or six months to collect all the evidence. And uh, I went to, I guess, to an outside uh, psychiatrist, uh, lab corp do blood, uh, saw an orthopedic guy, and the orthopedic guy also asked me about the blood disorder. Uh, that was a January. I got word from uh, the VA uh, that still the same with PTSD, uh, but the uh, blood disorder is now uh, permanent, makes me permanent disabled. Uh, so that's it. And, uh, but my doctor did say, uh, that my private doctor said that I'm in the very early stages. I could live for another 50, hundred years, maybe even 150 years with this before anything gets worse. But I'm back and, uh, I don't lie as much as I always did. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Neil. you, Neil. Thank you okay. for sharing that, that side of yourself. We appreciate that. Um, is Jeff, is John Huber on? Yes, he is. Yep, I, I'm still here. Oh, hi, John, because I, I don't see your face. Um, yep. I just jumped in at the last minute on the phone. Okay, but I'm, we're, glad, we're very glad to have you. Um, John, would you, would you like to uh, say a bit about your service, where you were, what, where and how I'll you keep, served? I'll keep it short and sweet because, quite frankly, I'm probably the the, uh, the most fortunate of the people I've heard from already. Um, and the only scary part of my life is I'm going to become the, I am the president elect of the Manhattan <laughs> Port Washington. <laughs> no, nothing about it, but I'm going to give it a shot. Um, I went to the service and I, I enlisted. I was going to be drafted anyway uh, in 1966. In 67, I was in Vietnam. It sounds like the same time that either Neil or Mark were there. And if it was Neil, he was probably in some rifle company going out to the boonies at night and clearing the, uh, clearing the, uh, the 10, 10 miles between us and the DMV, DMZ rather. Um, anyway, I got lucky. I went to the air wing. Um, everybody, every Marine is a, a rifleman, as we all know. But uh, I ended up going to the air wing and I was a crew chief in a, a radar unit. So we used to bring in helicopters with wounded and stuff like that up in Tongha. <clears throat> Excuse me, right near the medical, uh, medical three or medical fire. I forget now. Um, so I came, I, was, I didn't do the whole 13 months. We were supposed to do 13 months in those days. Um, I didn't do the 13 months. They pulled us out and we went to Iceland. You don't find too many guys that have been assigned to Iceland unless they're in the Air Force or something. Um, I, I, I finished out my time there and I ended up coming back to the States uh, where I, within a, within a year, I joined the New York State Police Department following in uh, Carl's place, I guess. Never got as far as him. Uh, I became, uh, I was doing a lot of undercover work for them. Uh, I did the Pimp Squad, which was a pleasure. Um, I took a lot of girls off the street, prostitutes, you know, young girls that turned into prostitutes because of the pimps. Uh, so that was a good, good time. Um, sure, I, I ended up retiring from the police department in 84, and I went to work for Liberty Mutual Insurance. I became the, the Northeast Region Director of Special Investigations. Um, and that was interesting also. And um, I'm trying to think what else I might have did. 
Of course, I went to Paris Island for boot camp. That was an experience. Um, I, I, I feel, I don't feel, st- I don't feel like I didn't get the full experience, but most of my friends, if you will, and acquaintances from the service um, weren't so much having med- medical med- medical uh, problems so much as the Agent Orange that I think somebody mentioned earlier. Uh, in fact, I just lost two of them recently. Um, I try, for the most part, I try to keep a low profile, as I think Kathy and and uh, Jeff will attest. Mm-hmm. Yes, I'm too. I'm pretty. I'm pretty. Pretty fortunate, actually, is all I can say. And that's about it. Now, John, I've got a question. Isn't there? Um... Maybe I don't think I'm mistaken, but isn't isn't there a group or something that you run related to veterans? Yeah, I'm a, well actually through the, I'm in quite a few organizations, but through the uh, <coughs> excuse me, the Knights of Columbus on the fourth degree, I'm the uh, Vic, uh, veteran services coordinator. Uh, through that, I work with the Nassau County people that do the same thing. I've never gone to the VA. I mean, I've gone to the VA, but I've never signed up for the VA because, quite frankly, I didn't think I needed anything, and so far I haven't. Um, I always had between the police department and the uh, and Liberty Mutual, I always had plenty of medical. I lost my wife 13 years ago, but it, it covered us and the kids. So I never saw a need to do it. I mean, there were so many of the people um, that could use it. I, I never signed up with them, but now I'm dealing with them. In fact, there's one of the, fe- one of the fellows that's in the uh, Marine Corps League with me, Father Capadano detachment, who works at the VA. So anything I need to know about the VA, I can, I can usually give him a call. But uh, mm-hmm. I've never I've never taken uh, taken any benefit from from the VA, and that's about it. Thank you, thank you, John. Thank you for sharing that. Um, well, Neil, thank you very much for going out in the, into the boonies at night. By the way, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's no, nothing. It's much fun, you know. If that's when the shadows move. And yeah, and you, sh- and you shoot them all. <laughs> it's, it's like the worst. So. Uh, mm-hmm. But, well, thank you. Um, thank you. I, I'd like to pose a question to the uh, to the clinicians that we have with us tonight, um, Gary, Dr. Lynn, Danielle. Um, we've used this term PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder, um, already several times since we've uh, started the the panel, and I um, I'm wondering if you can construct a picture of PTSD, feel free any one of the three of you to begin so that our audience that's watching and listening and will listen later um, can understand, you know, what that is, what it looks like and um, what its characteristics are and perhaps how it, you know, directly relates uh, to our veterans. So feel free, anyone can jump in and you can follow suit. Be happy to jump in. Hi, I'm Lynn. Um, prior to working at Northville, I worked at the Road Home Program, the Center for Veterans and Their Families, which is funded by the Warrior Care Network. So just to plug, if anyone's ever interested in um, some intensive treatment for PTSD, they do fantastic work there. Um, and so I think to paint a picture of what PTSD is, we think actually somewhere between 75% upwards of the population might experience a traumatic event in their life a much smaller percent of the population is gonna go on to experience PTSD. So it's really quite natural and normal for us to have a strong response to a trauma. When we think of a trauma as like a sense, um, a threat to your life, your sense of self, if we're thinking about sexual trauma. Um, So it's expected that we're gonna have a strong emotional response to that and a fear response to that. And what distinguishes that response that from PTSD is that we think of PTSD as being kind of an interruption in a natural recovery process. So we might naturally recover from trauma over time, whereas those who go on to experience PTSD get kind of stuck in that recovery process. Things that might stick us in a recovery process as human beings could be beliefs like things we tell ourselves like we're at fault for what happened. Um, So we might blame ourselves, we might blame somebody else um, for that trauma. And so a lot of the work that's done in some really great treatments that are quite effective for PTSD is actually poking at those sticking points, those things that keep us stuck in PTSD and learning to kind of question those thoughts. Um, And also, as I think uh, many of you alluded to already, kind of encouraging people to face the things that make them uncomfortable day to day. So walking, looking at those cracks on the sidewalk, 
and mm -hmm. facing those that discomfort um, or interacting with others, even when the drive is to not interact with others. And that's how we kind of over time unstick people. Um, and that sticking too might look like um, some of you have alluded to like a exaggerated startle response, um, unwanted memories about what happened that are just kind of like smacking you upside the head in the middle of the day. Um, and as well as nightmares, um, having negative mood, uh, negative beliefs about yourself. Um, that's kind of what it might end up looking like when you get stuck in that recovery process, maybe because of those beliefs um, that m can really benefit from therapy as, as you all have been speaking to already, which is great to hear. Thank you, Dr. Lynn. Thank Gary you. or Danielle, would you like you know, to say one something? Of, one of the things that makes it so complex is the person's resistance to deal with those issues, I think, as Neil said, it took a, a long, long time. But compounding the problem is the person's use of illicit substances. So if you know if they're struggling and they don't have an outlet, uh, and, and again, as, as Neil had so eloquently pointed out, that he, he, he was alone. Um, what you, what you see, and you know, he couldn't rely on family, couldn't rely on friends, uh, went or came home, got married and had to, you know, had to be a, you know, a functioning father. Um, but there are plenty of other, uh, people, veterans alike and, and others that will resort to alcohol, will resort to opioids, will resort, uh, resort to benzodiazepines. And what they're doing is medicating and over medicating the pain. So you're not dealing with the root cause, uh, which is the PTSD, which just grows deeper and firmer in the person's psyche over a long period of time. So by the time, especially if they end up in my agency, right? I, in, in the introductions you mentioned, you know, we're, we're a drug treatment program, we're licensed by Oasis, you know, the Office of Alcohol um, Addiction Services and Support. They changed their name recently, forgive me. Um, so we're dealing with the active substance abuse first. And that can take a long time to get a handle on before we can even begin to peel back the layers of the onion and deal with the PTSD issues the, the way that Lynn had just described, which is spot on. You know, if someone comes into the VA and, and, and says they have PTSD, you know, they'll, they'll work with some veteran groups, uh, the veteran psychiatrist, um, and this is not a knock on the VA system, but it's overwhelmed. It's not a secret. And the easiest thing to do is to script something to alleviate the pain, whether that pain is uh, uh, based on PTSD and, and traumatic experience or physical pain, because they have to move on to the next person and move on to the next person and move on to the next person. So a lot of times the medical community itself, it's called, uh, referred to as an iatrogenic addiction, the person follows the script of the physician and unknowingly is now dealing with an addiction issue. And we see a lot of that with, with the prescription pills and the opioids, which is huge in the veterans community. So there's a huge resistance and a fear of going back to the VA, knowing that they're probably just going to get a prescription for something. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what, what we have found that works, um, and I think Lynn said she's with Northwell and is partnerships, uh, you know, partnering, you know, the, the substance abuse community, the mental health community, the hospital system, partnering with veteran services, uh, veteran connected services. Um, in Suffolk County, uh, under Tom Romaine, who's a veteran himself, who runs the Suffolk uh, County Department of Veteran Services, partnering with, with those agencies to make sure people get the full wraparound services and treating patient-centric, the, the entire person mm -hmm. as best that you can. Yeah, Gary, uh, I'm really glad too that you mentioned partnerships, if I could just say, because I think um, there's yes. lots of, as you mentioned, like the VAs can be really overloaded, understandably, right? And so like the goal is to um, treat the symptoms maybe as quickly as possible. And so there's partner uh, partnerships like the Unified Behavioral Se uh, Health Center, um, yes. Northwell partner with the VA, um, or we think about the Warrior Care Network. Um, we have sites like um, Emory. Um, there's uh, also Rush University Medical Center, the Road Home Program. And these are places that are outside of the VA, like in, in the civilian world that are um, 
focus on treating veterans um, using science-backed approaches like cognitive processing therapy or prolonged exposure. Yeah. All right. Danielle. How, yes. How about, um, how about yourself? I, I, everybody's spot on with this. Um, I, I went into, I, I used to be with Northwell, was at uh, South Oaks and um, we, we knew about the United Behavioral um, Spot. Actually, um, uh, I was working in Jennings and Detox and Rehab there and we had several veterans come in and we, did, we didn't even know that it was available to, to refer our veterans to. So uh, a, a huge passion of mine, and I'm glad I have this opportunity at Victory Recovery Partners. We're also a VA community care provider, um, but it, it is extremely important that, um, especially community care providers that we uh, refer to each other and, and we utilize these community resources for our veterans, um, especially female veterans, very resistant to going to the VA. So um, many Can veterans- Can I ask why we, that is? Why is that, Danielle? Well, this is because, you know, the, the military in itself, but, but also it carries over to the VA is extremely male conformed. And the VA has made uh, outstanding strides to, to improve that. We have a great women's uh, clinic over at Northport, but however, uh, you know, pro providers are, scarce in, in that department or in they're overwhelmed. We have one OBGYN, for example, at the women's clinic handling, you know, all the, 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 the female veterans in Suffolk and Nassau County. So you're talking about a three month out wait for these type of appointments. Um, and for psychiatric appointments, um, it's just a very male conformed, um, you know, entity. So uh, we will feel, females feel more comfortable um, going to community uh, providers for most of their care. And um, I, I would say for, for a while, um, especially if you're a service connected veteran, you will be fee-based or, or, or sent through VA community care, used to be called fee-based, um, into other uh, facilities for treatment anyway, because it couldn't be provided for you at the VA, such as mammograms and um, certain uh, traumas at that time, if you, if you needed help with, it, it was not equipped uh, to treat. So um, females are still currently resistant, but I've found that through community providers um, we, we are seeing more female veterans come into the program. And if I could even, Danielle, piggyback on what you're saying as well, I think there's also a layer of for individuals who have experienced military sexual trauma, whether women or men, although more common among women, um, going to the VA can really be quite triggering um, yeah. and kind of a, a barrier to, to stepping yes. foot in there. Mm -hmm. Because you you think about North Park, you're you're literally going through three two flights. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> even get to the women's yeah. clinic on the third floor. So it's scary. It's very traumatic yeah. a spot. And, and in our C box in our local community clinics through the VA, we still do not have Pacific um, areas dedicated to female veterans. So even, you know, in the, the C box, which were created to be kind of closer to veterans in the community, they are just not, um, you know, as comfortable as a client would want to be, especially with dealing with, with these issues. And, um, and then also, you know, uh, substance abuse is at the forefront of all the majority of the mental health issues. Um, you know, two out of five of veterans in, in our treatment tracks um, are, are suffering from PTSD and co-occurring substance use disorder. And, um, you know, it, it's a common coping strategy for veterans now uh, to deal with their traumatic experiences. And um, it, it just prevents them from recovery. So we're really seeing that and we're seeing an increase due to COVID-19 right now of uh, a, a increased uh, signs of mental um, health issues uh, due to socialization, isolation, 
uh, you know, uh, increased uh, anxiety. We have the loss of employment, stability, and housing um, right now that are also contributing to the growing factor of PTSD and mental health issues among veterans and sufferers. Thank you, Danielle. You know, I, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to you all and I'm looking at uh, Carl Elena. Carl, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Carl. I have a question for you. Ahead, it's been a it's been a minute. It's been a minute since you served in, in the military. And I know that I know that back then uh, there wasn't there wasn't a diagnosis of PTSD, a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress syndrome. And you had thousands of young men and women coming back from the war and what did you what did you witness did you know not every day is a great day people struggle and uh, trying to adapt to being home after what they witnessed and lived you know we, we had some fellows on my ship that were depressed uh, and uh, it was we tried to get along with each other it was a different different situation i don't know what to say but uh, the, then when i got back to the states i was reassigned to a, a different uh, ship, uh, the USS Krishna, uh, which was in, in Norfolk, Virginia, a newly commissioned ship. And uh, the, the lieutenant of this engineering department uh, saw my, my credentials that after high school, I, I, I took a special course for uh, aeronautical engineering. And of course, I didn't go into the aeronautics unit. Of course, they put you where they want to put you. And so he put me in the engineering unit. So we worked together, try to watch each other in a sense of, but today, you know, it, it, it's a different world. In the same way like it today, I have a meeting once a week with two other gentlemen. One is 73, the other one is 70. And we talk about helping the parishioners in our parish. And uh, this one man, he tells me, Carl, I'm thinking of maybe I shouldn't be a Catholic. I says, well, it's not being a Catholic. It's being good. You know, cre creating something to help somebody. You don't have to be a Catholic. You can be Protestant. You can be Jewish. You can be Baptist. doesn't matter. Being good to one another and respecting, no matter what they are, it's you and the other people that you're associating with. Mm -hmm. That's the whole secret of life. Uh, and don't be jealous because Mr. Jones is making five times more salary than you're making, or he's driving a Mercedes and you're only driving a Chevrolet. So what? Does a Chevrolet take you the same distance that Mercedes takes you? What are you jealous about? Who cares? It's, it's carrying you to what you got to do and you respect that person. I don't care if you have more money than me. God, God bless you. Uh, so that's that's my that's my attitude in trying to help people. I go to I go to the outreach. I bring them banana bread. I bring them blueberry pound. In fact, tonight before I came here, I baked five banana breads with walnuts. I'm ready tomorrow. I'll deliver a few over to some families who uh, say, "Gee, thank you. You're welcome. Enjoy it." Case closed. Carl, since since you're on that subject and um, you've lived a long time, um, there's a lot of wisdom bottled up in that in that head of yours. Can you tell us what's the what's the secret? What I is there a it's secret? It's of longevity and of good yeah. health. I was married 54 years when the love of my life died. I met her in February 1949, and here's your, one of your secrets. We kept company. You hear the term kept company? I went out with her. We went to the, the, the movies, Howard Johnson's, and she was home by 10 o'clock. Her mother and father were at the door when I brought her home. <laughs> I kissed her on the cheek, good night. And I tell my granddaughters the same story. Papa took Nana out. He got engaged. November 1949, met her in February 1949, kept company with her until September 3rd, 1950. 
got married by the priest, went to the, went, went, went to the uh, function we had our party, came home, went to the Biltmore Hotel. That was the first time I went to bed with grandma. <laughs> and that was life. Yeah. You know, it was it was it was an enjoyable thing, and we lived together, and we went all over together, period. And we raised hey, our children. Yes, sir. It's John Huber. Yes, I went sir. together with my wife for five years before we ever got married, and we got married. I didn't have sex with my wife until two nights after we were married. God bless. <laughs> that's that's what the life is all about. We respect. Yeah, that was it. We respect it. Today, you see people, I, I look at children, I try to talk with them all. They don't even know who their fathers are, some of these poor kids. It's hurting. Yeah. You see them. I, I, I go to, uh, at, uh, my, and with the Kiwanis, I, I used to go out to the uh, uh, the school over in Belmore, where the chat, Bosies, where the challenge kids were. I'd go out there and I'd make pizza pies for these these challenge children, and I'd give them and had the box with the pizza. Each one take home. These poor kids are gonna put in their backpacks vertically. No, no, no. You gotta carry. <laughs> God knows how it got home. But I showed them how to make cookies and all. It breaks my heart. I see. I I, I go uh, I go. Jeff will say it to to the uh, Ronald McDonald House. Here I had a child who had brain cancer operation and he's sitting with his mother from Montana. He didn't know what lasagna was. And I sat down, I gave him lasagna. It it breaks my heart of how some children are so innocent and don't know what it's about. And so you gotta respect them and try to help them. This is what life's about. Yeah. Don't be greedy Carl, and selfish. Carl is taking food orders after this uh, podcast. <laughs> yes. uh, you know, what I see, uh, especially with, with Carl and John, I don't know much about Neil, but it's giving back and service to others and being in a service organization like the Kiwanis Club. Uh, and uh, that's uh, our home club of Manhasset, Port Washington. And you guys do a lot of service. And that's part of maybe keeping your mental health, especially during this uh, pandemic we've been in. And uh, uh, this one here is for Danielle, basically leading up to a question. Uh, have you seen any significant challenges for veterans during the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, yes, we, yes, I have. Um, specifically, we've seen uh, an increase of incarcerated veterans um, or involved with, uh, um, you know, with the department, you know, justice department. So we're having, you um, through tasks being referred veterans that have been, um, that have legal involvements. Um, we've seen an increase in homeless veterans. Um, and we've also seen uh, an increase of uh, substance use with veterans specifically. Yeah, what I see is that with the loss of personal contact, whether you're a high school student, a senior or a veteran, you miss your your weekly or monthly meetings with uh, your people, like yeah. in, in a sense, uh, uh, people at the American Legion or the VFW in this case. And I'm sure that's had an effect, exacerbated an already existing uh, problem. And, uh, you know, how people coped with that, again, going back, Neil and, and John were of service. And, uh, you know, we called on others to see how they were doing but it didn't substitute for being in person. And next month is the first time we'll be in meeting in person as a club. And it's gonna be great for, for, for a lot of folks. So, you know, that's, that's a big issue, social isolation that was brought on by this pandemic. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, Neil, is there anything that you did to, to cope or to any healthy coping skills that you, uh, Undertook, well, whether it's hiking uh, or fishing. Fishing, you said, blue fishing. Well, I'm, I'm a fisherman. Uh, uh, you know where Raritan Bay is? Yes. Raritan Bay? Well, uh, I guess about nine years ago, uh, uh, we're having a garage sale, and this elderly man got pushed up with a uh, wheelchair, and the lady was with him and said, he's looking for fishing rods. She said, yeah, I got something. I got, you know, just stuff I want to get rid of. And he told me about this place called Weapon Station Earl. Uh, 
Uh, they have a pier going down to Raritan Bay, uh, two and a half miles. Uh, now it's all concrete. There's two rail lines that are on it. Uh, occasionally there'll be an aircraft carrier there, other supply ships. Uh, but as a veteran, I was allowed to fish there. So it took two, two weeks uh, to get vetted, get all the paperwork done. And I was allowed to go. Uh, I was able to bring my wife and friends, whatever. Uh, two years later, they changed the ruling. You had to be 70% disabled. Well, at the time, I wasn't, didn't get any rating from the VA. And a short time after that, I got my 70% uh, PTSD. Actually, every year they change uh, leadership in the place. Uh, they have a uh, new commandant said you had to be 100% disabled. So I missed the whole year. And during that year, I became uh, uh, very upset. Uh, I had my stamps and my stamp collector also. Uh, friends I was able to talk with. Uh, but when I got my 2019, I got my letter, I was 100%, I was okay. Last year we had COVID, so there was no fishing on the pier. But uh, that is a place I go uh, 50, 75 times uh, during the summer fishing. Even my wife, one of my sons. Uh, but this whole thing with COVID, uh, I find I'm sort of back where I was years back. I enjoy being by myself. That's this whole, not just this year, but the years and years. I used to go bike riding 25, 50 miles by myself. I didn't like to bike ride with other people. I used to go walking 15, 20 miles by myself. Uh, and I found a little bit, uh, I do the same thing now with COVID. Uh, I do my shopping at ShopRite or Costco once, once a week, once every other week post office, I watch TV with my wife, but you fall back into that rut. Uh, I talk to the uh, therapist every week. Uh, it, it, it's just very hard. You're doing it on, uh, uh, on a video screen. The first week that we did it, uh, we did it on the phone and she says she needs to see my facial expressions. And you know, that's, part of her business and then we started doing the video so the video has been a big help uh, but still you just you need some contact with people uh, it's very hard what we're going through uh, all the things I'm just going to the casino we still uh, uh, once or twice a month it's only 70 miles from where we live uh, in Atlantic City you don't do that stuff anymore. You don't go to a restaurant. Everything is takeout. You know, so uh, uh, it's all different. Now. Even with the VA, uh, I go to Brook, but I haven't gone to see a doctor over there in over a year. They call up uh, every four or five months, and uh, I got a PCP over there. She asked me fifty questions. I have the drug doctor over there who's. Helped me with my sleeping, which was a total disaster in uh, 2016 and 2017. Uh, I ended up uh, more depressed than I ever was. So not only was I taking two, two different medications for sleep, I was on two different medications for depression. Uh, and one morning, uh, three o'clock in the morning, uh, I just woke up and I walked into the living room, was looking for the bearded man. And uh, that's when I realized that I was looking for, you know, like I was hallucinating that there was somebody there. Uh, so the VA has good, good points. They have some bad points. Uh, uh, that's it. I mean, uh, one more thing I like to say, in 2012, when we went to the first reunion, uh, there were 38 men there, uh, 
twelves that I had spent quality time with in Vietnam at one point or another, uh, and we went around the whole room. Everyone said uh, what they did for a living, what their family makeup was, how long they were married, where I was uh, thirty-two years at the time, and I was pretty happy. Uh, and then you go around the room. I've been divorced three times, in and out of drug rehab, uh, alcohol rehab. Uh, I haven't worked. Uh, uh, what I'm doing with the VA. And as, as it's going around the room, I'm saying, I know I got problems, but I don't realize how lucky I am. And that's part of the reason why I never went to the VA. Uh, Nothing ever happened to me, and uh, the guilt that I had all these years that uh, I never got wounded, and not that I wanted to get wounded, and uh, these poor people that uh, came back, see now in the commercials every five minutes, uh, and I feel terrible. That whole period of time, I couldn't even watch that stuff. I could stop. So that's it. Okay. All right. Hey, so do they, do they help you or how do you help other people with, you know, real survivor's guilt? Uh, well, this lady therapist that I see, she's really been a help. Like I said, I've been going to VA uh, for seven years. Uh, every month, month and a half, I see a psychiatrist over there. Uh, the drug doctor, she calls now every three months uh, to see how I'm doing. Uh, but the meeting up with people after all of these years and finding out what they have been through. Uh, uh, and then you find uh, three years down the line, one guy uh, passes away, then another one in uh, December. Uh, uh, December was a very bad month. Uh, New Year's Day, 1968, there was a ceasefire and a shot rang out. Uh, all I know is that a company commander was hit by a sniper bullet. Uh, four medics were around them. A medevac ship came in, took them out, and you don't hear nothing else out in the boondocks. No one ever tells you anything after that. I thought for sure the guy was dead. Uh, and when we went to this reunion, uh, Captain Reed was there. Uh, wow. uh, it was amazing. Uh, uh, you can see like I'm near crying at this point. Uh, you don't see someone after all these years and think the guy is dead. Uh, wow. And there he is. But, but he did a lot of suffering. Uh, uh, he became a lawyer. He came from a military family. He became a lawyer. Uh, uh, alcohol, drugs. Uh, it was clean for nine years. And this past December, uh, uh, he got sick in the beginning of the month, by the end of the month, he was dead. Uh, and another guy, uh, so Larry Willis, uh, uh, he was uh, an 11-month 11, 11 man for me. Uh, I started in March, he started in April, and I uh, left a uh, month after I did. Uh, he passed away from cancer. Uh, and it's very hard every time uh, you hear somebody passes away. Uh, in our village where we live here, uh, uh, we have a veterans club. Uh, I made friends with, uh, uh, I think it was 96 years old, a Marine. and. Uh, in 2018, I went to the honor flight down to Washington, uh, and his son pushed his wheelchair for him, and I sat in the seat next to him. Uh, uh, this Jewish kid who made it to Iwo Jima, and uh, we went to uh, the Air Force Memorial. The uh, Marines had a color guard over there, and he wanted to go see these Marines. So uh, some and I, we walked him to where the uh, Marine color guard was. There's a bunch of kids. They were like, you know, 
I would say 15, but they were like 22, 23. Uh, he had his jacket on from Iwo Jima and all his uh, medals and stuff. Uh, they were like, like this, they were bowing to him. The legend, that's who they said. It was a legend, the survivor of Iwo Jima. Uh, but you meet people, uh, uh, and that's part of what keeps you going. Uh, I told you my sons were both Eagle Scouts uh, after he left the uh, Boy Scouts. Uh, uh, I was the Eagle chairperson for five years after that, and I helped out, and uh, probably about 20 kids out with their Eagle projects. Um, and uh, uh, you got things that help you. The, uh, but certain things, they never let go. Uh, the bad thoughts, uh, reoccurring nightmares, uh, being in dark places. Uh, I can't watch even on TV. My wife likes everything, scary movies, you name it. When they have comic attractions, if they're too gory, I like, uh, I got to bury my head in the pillow or something like that. Uh, so there's things that never let go. They're always there. I find it a little bit easier. I could talk to this lady every week. Uh, but uh, it's just hard. And uh, like I said, I yeah. used to lie. I, yeah. Everyone knew that I was a nice guy where I worked. Yeah. It's just very tough. Yeah. Okay. I'm, a, I'm a younger vet. I'm Mark uh, Pat's uh, husband. Hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. I'm a retired uh, lieutenant colonel. And uh, I had gotten called up at age uh, 43. I'm 73 now, so 30 years ago for the uh, first Gulf War. So I was there for nine months. And uh, you really do, uh, Neil, you do form a bond. So we had guys with us for nine months. And uh, we went through our uh, 38 scuds, all that kind of good stuff. Got caught out there. We took all these uh, weird... Uh, meds that they, they wanted to take because they were afraid, you know, we're going to get gassed. Uh, uh, the uh, first Gulf War vets are now part of the VA because they're testing us for uh, different types of diseases, that kind of stuff. So I got to get up there and get my physical. But uh, we have a reunion uh, with Say Zoom. Do Christmas. Say do Christmas. Yeah, every, every uh, Christmas. I was the only Jewish guy, but uh, we had... Uh, Every, every Christmas uh, now, I always have a reunion using Zoom. We've done that. Prior to that, we used a free telephone call. We've had a couple reunions down in Atlanta because our uh, unit was from Atlanta originally, from Fort McPherson. So it's, uh, it's a great bond. And, uh, you know, we're all kind of messed up. We've all been there. You know, we all have yep. some kind of PTSD because, you know, you're out there. You're, I'm carrying a loaded weapon for nine months. And... Uh, Hey, I go back to my civilian job. The hardest thing when I went back was to figure out what tie I was going to wear because I was wearing my uh, BDUs every day for nine months, and we never had a day off. So it's uh, so it was wild, but uh, yeah. it's a relationships. Yeah, my father served in World War II. Uh, uh, he was under General Patton. Uh, Same where I was in Third Army. Yep, he went through. Uh, uh, Northern Italy, uh, Belgium, and Germany. And he was with the unit of some kind of, whatever the number was, tank destroyers. I don't know. I just thought it was a tank with like a bulldozer. I don't know what else yeah. you think. But uh, he passed away in 1971. Uh, yeah. I guess about five years ago, uh, my older brother and I uh, did some homework. So a tank destroyer, it's a Jeep. That pulls a 90 millimeter cannon right. on two wheels, and they use a high explosive shell. They have two shells that are armor piercing. And uh, so it's two men that handle a cannon, and one man there with a 30 caliber machine gun. And they would get themselves a little cover and hope to get off two shots when a panzer tank uh, will come the way. <coughs> And he never spoke about what he did in World War II. Uh, he never 
we used to walk all the time. He had a heart, heart, heart condition. Uh, we never spoke about that. Uh, he asked me some questions about my okay. service. Okay. We never spoke about that. Uh, all right, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, anyway, Neil, before I, uh, Gary, I, uh, before I get to you, I'd like to ask uh, um, Daniela uh, something here. I mean, I, I'm seeing the veteran population and, and different, uh, different uh, risk factors, especially during a pandemic. You know, with regards to mental health, you have the cultural awareness, uh, veterans of color, you have women, you know, sometimes uh, uh, being sexually uh, taken advantage of, and uh, all those that, whether it's other groups in regards to mental health. I mean, these people seem to be most at risk during a pandemic. Is this something you've seen? And Uh, yes, I, I, and as far as vulnerable groups, I, I've really seen that the uh, most vulnerable groups and those with psych uh, psychotic disorders and uh, those who have a, a recently experienced uh, homelessness. Um, we're seeing increased uh, suicide um, risk for these particular veterans. Uh, with regard to veterans of color, we're seeing increased risk uh, also. Um, you know, with chronic uh, conditions, um, uh, toxic exposures, they're, they're really at risk for, for that as well. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing things hit, hit hard. You know, we've been working with uh, veterans and we've, we've seen a delay in mental health treatment in general with patients being able to get appointments, um, patients that are uh, applying for claims to be able to receive mental health services to the VA um, and then not being able to get to those appointments because providers were closed. So now we're again seeing issues like the claims backlog growing now, uh, veterans waiting to get compensation and disability of claims um, and get help. And we do have um, you know, help out there for vets, especially for for uh, mental health issues and to get treatment. And uh, we have like the Restoration Act helping veterans get, you know, priority services for, for these mental health issues at the VA. But, and again, we have, you know, just increased in homelessness, increase of, of, of veterans losing their employment right now due to the pandemic um, and, you um, just in, in, an increased uh, amount of uh, mental mental health issues um, and an increased amount of substance use disorder. It's not enough uh, availability right now to get to the VA. So it's just really important for us to uh, refer to each other, uh, uh, work together as community resources for veterans and all veteran service providers to work together and make sure that you know, veterans can get as many services as they can under one roof, you know, under one roof, um, so that they can see therapists, they can get peer support, they can get medical assistance treatment if they want, they can get behavioral health services, which is needed, they can get the wellness care, but also to have providers look into how to be able to refer you uh, or refer out the clients that come to us for these therapies you know where can they get food who can i call out you know i could call brendan over at Lawland cares if this veteran needs something to eat i could call this person you know we have to uh, really work together and um you know although the va uh will will send veterans out to different providers you know, throughout the community, a lot of times those providers don't know other than the specific services that Optimum Care or the VA is paying for to deliver to that veteran because they can't go to the VA for a therapy group, let's say. Right. I'm, I'm hoping that more providers will attend more things like this so that we know the other needs of our veterans and we're seeing a need for them to have food, for them to have to, to get housing, um, for employment referrals, you know, right. and, and just these things. And, and especially peer support, you know, um, 
so that we're offering that other than, you know, Dwyer was the Dwyer project was down for a while due, due to COVID, but, you know, being able to refer veterans out to these resources right. or looking for projects that offering all of these services under one roof can really help out these veterans tremendously. Right. I know a friend of mine, uh, Lonnie Sherman, he uh, runs a, a nonprofit, General Needs, and they provide clothing and other items to veterans who are homeless. Uh, now, uh, Gary, very, you know, I'm, I'm reading your bio here. You're a champion of patients' rights. You testified in front of both the New York State Assembly and Senate on expanding treatment and accessibility for all people in need of addiction services. Uh, and you've worked with both the mayors and governor's offices toward the equality of the addicted. Also, you spoke in front of the United Nations during their conference on worldwide drug policy. And, and I would imagine the need is great with veterans. There's not enough funding. Uh, I know recently, we, we did a, a big thing with Port Counseling, Long Island Reach on the, the take back, the proposed 20% cuts to funding. And I guess with the funds coming in, they put what they took out right back in. So it wasn't really anything extra, but there's such a need for funding. Instead of waiting online and getting pills at the VA to expand treatment services for veterans, especially, uh, I mean, What's what's going on there? What, what the, the need has got to be astronomical. Well, I think as as everybody has mentioned, uh, there's no doubt the need is actually increasing significantly during the pandemic. People are stuck at home. I mean, e everything is increasing: alcoholism, opioid addiction, suicide, uh, domestic violence, child abuse. E everybody's just stuck at home for, for too long. Um, so we're seeing an uptick on, on all of these things. Um, I think one of the things, uh, the, the term, I think it was Lynn or maybe Danielle had mentioned, you know, patients with co-occurring disorders, you're talking about uh, typically addiction and a mental health issue. But when working with the veterans, it, it's more than just mental health and, and uh, substance abuse. It's also physical health. Uh, I, um, yes. You know, Neil mentioned Agent Orange. But I, I've got an entire cohort of patients that have come back from Iraq and Afghanistan now that are dealing with burn pit exposure. So that, that's, that's the, this generation's Agent Orange, um, you know, knowingly exposing veterans to toxic fumes while they're burning garbage. And by garbage, you mean car tires, batteries, you know, all, you know, toxic materials that common sense would tell you don't stand next to but it, yet you know now now we have this problem um it really always comes down to advocacy and and meeting with your local politicians your local state and assembly people um you know senator gillibrand senator schumer going all the way all the way up and advocating for the needs of the many and trying to move dollars there was an article in Crane's uh, health today, that the opioid settlement money that the attorney general, the attorney attorneys generals negotiated uh, in New York might have found its way into the general budget instead of the budget of the Office of Addiction Services and Support. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be yeah. you know, uh, ongoing discussions about making sure that that money gets allocated to where it's necessary. One of the things that I learned in my career early on when I was on the board uh, for the governor is veteran services in New York are funded because the VA won't pay for them. Someone who is discharged yeah. from the military for a mental health or a substance abuse issue receives a dishonorable discharge. And once you receive a dishonorable discharge, you can't access services at the VA. So, you know, exactly. the issues that yeah. arise when people come home, mental health and substance abuse, if they emerge after the discharge, then they're entitled to help at the Veterans uh, Administration. But programs like Phoenix House, Samaritan Village, uh, uh, St. Joe's up in Saranac Lake, they, they've received program, uh, dollars from New York State to provide residential treatment for women, uh, um, chemical dependency rehab for veterans because the federal government won't pay for it. 
And if you remember from a few years ago, Senator Gillibrand's platform was military assault on women. Unfortunately, you know, the election cycle is over and not much has changed. I think you know, Danielle very bravely, by the way, mentioned that she was, you know, a, a victim of that. I'm seeing men that are victims of sexual assault in the military. And th that is even more difficult to elicit out, you know, mental health, burn pits, and now a man that has been raped by other men. The, the humiliation, the, the violation, the, the, the issues that they're dealing with on a daily basis, this is why we have such an amazing astronomical increase in suicide among our returning veterans. Yeah. I, I heard um, uh, the gentleman before uh, talking about you know, doing good and, and being good and, and, and being healthy minded. Um, PTSD did exist in World War II. It was just called battle fatigue back then. It's not, not until the American the Medical Shelter. Association gave it, gave it a diagnosis. Even in Korea, it wasn't called PTSD. It wasn't until uh, in, in soldiers returned from Vietnam that research was done on, on mental illness. Uh, and that, the, that, that diagnosis for the AMA came out of the work done at the VA. But we've always had it. It's just was, you know, it's, it's always been called something else, but it's just uh, stunning to what, what we have to deal with, but coming full circle to your original question, Jeff, what, what we do and, and, and what, what I've done as, as an agency leader is keep these issues front and center in, ter in terms of the local politicians. It doesn't matter if you're blue or red and what your belief system is, who's ever in office, that's the person that you need to be sitting in front of. That's that's for sure. Kathy, do you have anything to add to that? I think the need is great. We need advocacy for, for sure. Uh, we need to increase funding uh, to veterans. Uh, uh, there's no question about that. I, every day I see something about mental health. Well, we're so concerned about mental health. Uh, we should be taking it even more seriously. Uh, and the, the amount of drugs that uh, are coming into the country or are being used. Uh, it's, it's, I see the crime statistics. I see the overdose statistics on the heroin task force in Nassau County, and I'm privy to some of these stats. And it's alarming up tremendously since the start of the pandemic. And what are we doing about it? Well, we have to talk about it. We have to talk with our elected representatives. We have to uh, get more money for those that need it. It's that simple. We have to remove the stigma of shame and guilt. Exactly. Yes. That's yes. exactly right, Gary. That's exactly right. And the right. stigmatism. Yes. And, and to jump on what, what Gary said too, the ability for all veterans to be able to receive treatment, because if they're not service connected, as he said, they, they're, they cannot get, um, you know, VA eligibility. And, um, you know, one of the things I love about the community care providers is they most will like victory, we will treat them with, we take all insurances. That's another problem, veterans that have TRICARE that are, that are service connected, TRICARE is not taken everywhere. So, you know, if we can have veterans, uh, you know, entities help them even get insured, veterans that, that can um, qualify for, for Medicaid um, to, to get that assistance so that they can get treatment. You yeah, know, the or, fundamental uh, problem is the reason TRICARE is not taken everywhere is because TRICARE doesn't cover everything. No, it doesn't. Exactly. Right. So, it, it's so if, you're, if you're a TRICARE <laughs> member, you're limited to either the VA or a hospital-based right. system. And as you right. said earlier, people don't want to go back to big institutions. It re-traumatizes them. Yes, I'm going to share a flyer now, folks. So if anybody in the audience needs to contact you, uh, it's right here. Uh, and uh, this way they get to see uh, exactly who to call, emails, names. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's very important that uh, you just don't sit by and, and suffer in silence or say, as Nee would say, everything's okay. Mm -hmm. Ask for help. That's the biggest step you can make is asking for help. That's exactly uh, right. Yeah. So, uh, uh, definitely uh, uh, 
do this. And uh, I mean, I want to thank everybody for 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 being here tonight. I mean, uh, the clinicians, you brought your A game. Uh, for those who had served, including uh, Danielle, thank you for your service. Uh, tremendous, you. really tremendous. Uh, and uh, we're all in uh, 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 debt uh, to your services and, and uh, love for this country. So uh, if anybody else has anything to add uh, at this point, now would be a good time. Any parting uh, words of wisdom there, Kathy? Oh, words of wisdom. No, I think I would just like to say a sincere thank you to the panel. Uh, to our veterans um, that you put yourselves in harm's way. And uh, I know that I am profoundly grateful um, for what you do and what you have done. And to our clinicians, um, I know this year has been brutal on you guys, trying to help as many people as possible. It's a tsunami of a crisis and doing things uh, in a way that you never did before, you know, uh, like uh, on Zoom and not being able to be face to face sometimes, or a lot of times with people. So thank you for that. I, I know your schedules are very, very difficult. Thank you. All right, well, that, that being said, uh, I wanna again, thank everyone for being here tonight. And uh, uh, we intend on doing monthly discussions at Project Help Long Island and, uh, I'll send you all a link. We will have it up on our Facebook page, Project Help Long Island. We have an Instagram account, a Twitter account, uh, and a website, projecthelplongisland.org. And uh, hope you visit us sometime. And uh, we will continue our advocacy. Uh, and we like featuring such uh, professionals as yourselves and, and, and people that make a difference, whether it's veterans or seniors or high schoolers. Um, everybody does suffer um, and uh, we need to address that. There's no question about it. So if, if that's all we have, then uh, all I can say is thank you, Carl. Stop cooking for tonight. That's it. You're done. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Good night, all. All right. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. Thank you. All right. Good night. Thank you, everyone.